I mean, I had all these people that followed me from Dance with the Stars that loved me. Mm. And when the book hit the shelves, I was terrified. I was like, all these people are going to see a side of me that they have not seen and they're going to hate me. Everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. Today's guest is a real American hero. After watching the Twin Towers collapse on 9-11, he immediately enlisted in the military. Having no interest in playing it safe, he headed directly for the front lines, joining the infantry and getting himself assigned to the 101st Airborne Division. He deployed twice to Iraq, but just three months into his second deployment, the Humvee that he was driving was ripped apart by an IED nearly killing him. He woke up five days later in a hospital in Germany, his left arm and left leg both amputated. He had to endure a brutal parade of surgeries and seemingly endless recovery and rehabilitation before he could finally return home to his family. But even then, he wasn't out of the woods. Slowly, a deep depression quietly overtook him, turning him from a friendly, vibrant man into an angry person he hardly recognized. His marriage dissolved and his frequent drinking landed him in county jail for 10 days for a DUI. He knew at that point that he had to make a change. Now look, he is the first to admit that his life has not been a tidy Hollywood story, but despite the ups and downs, the second act of his life has actually been even more incredible than the first. Determined to be a good role model for his kids, he found his way back to the gym and began to rebuild himself, mind and body. His determination and transformation were so inspiring that he began to attract national attention and his incredible story of triumph over tragedy has seen him grace the cover of Men's Health Magazine, appear on Ellen and the Today Show, and star in the military-inspired competition series American Grit. And despite having only one arm and one leg, he earned his way to third place on the mega hit, Dancing with the Stars. So please, help me in welcoming the founder of the No Excuses Charitable Fund and the author of the incredible Living with No Excuses, The Remarkable Rebirth of an American Soldier, Retired Army Sergeant and All-Around Badass, Noah Galloway. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Dude, it is very good to have you. Your story has obviously been on my radar since back at Quest, and yes. this is an unbelievable story of somebody who A, is insanely vulnerable and willing to talk about the truth of what the journey has been like, but really has made an astonishing, like the, the physical shape that you're in is amazing for somebody that has all of their appendages. It's miraculous for somebody that doesn't. Walk me through like that mindset, like how you built yourself back up. Well, I mean, fitness was something that I got into at a young age and, you know, always carried me through whatever job I had. You know, I did construction. It was manual labor. When I ended up in the infantry, I fit in perfectly into that world because it's very physical. And when I was injured and went through that depression and was struggling, I knew that I was always happier when I was healthier. So that was one of the things that got me into changing my eating habits, getting back in the gym, which wasn't easy at all. I mean, I tell people all the time, what, what that actually showed me was a side of fitness that I was not used to, being that person walking to the gym that was insecure. Mm. I didn't want people to see me struggling, but I had to get over that. And you started going late at night, right? I did. Yes, because I wasn't, you know, there's a lot, I meet people all the time, we meet them all the time, people that want to get in shape, but they're worried about joining the gym, mm -hmm. what they're going to do, and I got to experience that, but then as I started exercising and feeling better, then I didn't care what time of day I went. Then I started using that to my advantage, where I tell people, you know, I had to convince myself I was doing what others can't, not in an arrogant way, just with, to myself. Right. Because there, you know, no matter what gym you go to, there's always somebody bigger, stronger, faster. But I could stand there and have a guy next to me that is bigger than me and think, but could he do it missing arm or leg? I mean, deep down, I hope he could. Right. But I have to. You have to give yourself that mentality that you're doing what other people can't. When I meet someone who battles with obesity, I say, well, then you have struggles ahead of you, so you will earn that and appreciate it more. And so I think that mindset of doing what other people can't is what really drives me to want to do the best. I love that. 
Uh, I'm a huge believer in, and I like the balance that you're talking about between you really, I want to win, right? I want to play at the highest level and I want to win. I want to beat everybody. Now that doesn't mean I want them to trip up and fall down. I want them to perform their best yes. as well, but I still want to win. And you've talked about how you were meant to be a soldier and you talk about that notion that so few people are willing to go into the military, let alone be able to thrive once they get there. Um, how can people cultivate that what all call a warrior's mindset. I don't know if you would agree with that terminology or not. You mean like how I deal with it? Because I know for me, if I understand what you're asking, like what I part of my depression was losing that because I felt like I had found a home, a place in combat, and it was taken away. And so now I had to find something new that piqued my interest, that would keep that adrenaline going. You know, after I got back into shape, started to run off course races, you know, Spartan, Tough Mudders, marathons, uh, something as simple as giving speeches. You know, that, you know, is simple, I enjoy doing it, but wanting to always top my last speech, or I go somewhere and speak and have other speakers, like I want those speakers to do well, but it's like, no, I'm gonna do better. Right. I'm about to just knock it out of the park. And those things get my adrenaline going. Now, are those things that you cultivate? Which So really my question is about how people can build that into their own into mind. Into their own mind. Right. Well, because you, you struggled so much in your journey to get going again. There, I'm guessing there was some process to your self-talk, to how you were framing the world that allowed you to get moving again. Well, I mean, this isn't on the same mindset of that uh, doing what others can't. My main thing that happened was my, my, I am very close to my kids. I have three kids, they're seven, nine, and 12, and they are my motivation. When I was going into the gym in the beginning, I, I tell people all the time, you have to have something stronger than your fear, and mine were my children. The day that I walked out in the living room and my three kids were sitting there, and I knew that I was showing my two boys what a man is, and that's what they're gonna grow up to be, and I was showing my little girl how a man's supposed to be, and that's what she's gonna look for one day, mm -hmm. I knew I had to make a change. And I admit to people, I, I talk about it in my book, I'm very open and honest, it did not happen overnight. Just because I had that realization that I had to be better, it didn't just happen. I would make a mistake, fall flat on my face, but it was the thought of them that got me up and going, and it was the thought of them that pushed me through those beginning workouts, getting back into shape, doing whatever it was and pushing myself to be better. I tell people all the time, you have to have something stronger than your fears. And for me, it is my kids. And I, I use that in whether it's fitness, running a race, business, whatever it is, we all get scared. That's what makes things exciting. Mm. But you have to have something stronger than that to say, you know what, I may be afraid to do this, but there's something more important that I have to do this for. Well, have you ever encountered somebody that doesn't have kids or they don't immediately know what that thing is? Like they really want it, they want to get in shape, yes. but they don't. Well, it's not easy, but I mean, you have to, there's something in all of our lives that is important to us. You know, whatever that is. I don't think there's anything wrong with someone saying, you know what, I want to have a big house and a sports car, whatever it is. You got to want it bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I am big on with my kids and other kids, and I've always told people they probably have nieces or nephews or someone near them that looks up to them. And that's what you have to go off of. There is someone watching you, you may not be a child, there is someone watching you that you will motivate. Like I love the fact that I ended up, you know, in the spotlight and now my story reached more and more people. But if you just motivate one person, that is a world of difference for them. And that's what people have to keep that mindset of, is like, you know, when you do things, you're not just doing it for yourself, you're mm -hmm. doing it for someone else. I wanna talk about that for a second. So you live a life of service in a way that is, in fact, I'm gonna tell maybe a slightly more obscure story from your background, because I think people understand 9-11, joining, like they get that immediately. But the story where I was like, this dude, like he, you live a life of service. Like it wasn't just the military, military can come and go, you're still gonna be living a life of service. And it was when you were in county jail and the, the big guy was trying to eat your- um, Cellmates cookies. Yeah, and tell us that story, because this, this to me was an incredible insight into who you are. Um, uh, you know, there I am, I'm in the county jail, and I mean, the first meal we had, you know, I'm sitting there, it's crappy food. And just to paint the picture for people, this is after your accident. Yeah, oh yeah, you're, I'm missing arm and leg. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm in the county jail, and I'm sitting there, and this guy from another table just gets up, big burly guy, 
and walks over and says to the guy across from me, let me get that, and then drinks his watered down Kool-Aid, which I realize is very important because <laughs> that little bit of flavor is all you get because throughout the day you're drinking water out of the out of your sink, mm. and, you know, and then just took like a biscuit off his tray. I remember sitting there thinking, okay, don't get in the middle of it, let it go, let it go. Well, then, you know, the guys who were there for a long time, people put money on an account they could go and get uh, snacks, whatever they wanted. And my cellmate had ordered these cookies, and my cellmate every night I was trying to have a conversation with him, and he just, you couldn't. He was out there. He was like, ever since that day, ever since that day, I was like, what day, you know? And it was, he would talk about how he just, he was like in his 40s. He just needed to get back to his mom. The other people that were locked up with me said he shouldn't be there. Right. He, had a, he had a mental condition. They, they didn't like that he was there. So I knew you couldn't have a conversation with this guy. He had his cookies. I'm sitting outside playing cards with some guys, and that big burly guy goes into our cell. And I'm watching him, and I'm like, what is he doing in there? One of the guys playing cards is like, I don't know. I was like, I think he's eating his cookies. He's like, I think he is. I was like, no. I went in there and I just tore into him. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, man, I'm just in here talking. I said, no, you're eating his cookies. I said, you need to get out. I mean, I said a few choice words. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I um, went and uh, sat down and just stared at him. And he just stood there for a while. Then he went and he went to his cell. Mm -hmm. And then the next meal, he didn't come out. And I was like, oh, crap. I'm only here for 10 days. I'm gonna get shanked. You know, I've right. seen TV. You know, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's making a, something out of a toothbrush. Like this is going down. I'm only here for 10 days, and then for dinner he comes out. So he misses lunch. He comes down for dinner, and he walks over again to the guy across from me, and the guy covers his tray and says no, and he slides his Kool Aid to me, and I'm like, and then the guy next to me slides his Kool Aid to me. And I just look at the guy and stare at him. And he walked off. And suddenly, I'm like top dog in the county. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was crazy, because then from then on, like there's a TV that's up on a wall. And they're like, you know, what station should we put it on? I was like, I don't care. You know, they wanted my opinion on everything. Right. But I was just concerned about that guy. And I didn't mean to, I wasn't trying to be alpha of the cell block. Right. You know, I was just worried about that guy, that guy had, I mean, everyone in that cell was worried about him. Everyone in that cell block was worried about that one guy. And it's funny you bring that up because I love telling that story because it's crazy that it even, it's like out of a movie. It literally <laughs> is out of a movie. When I was reading the book, I was like. The movie Life? Especially, Biscuit. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially because in the, in the book, we're inside your head, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that the moment before, and I have the chills, the moment before when he takes it and you think, God, I'm only here for 10 days. Like, don't get involved don't get in this. Involved. But then you, you mention it a couple more times. So it's like clearly still on your mind. And so when he wanders in and I was like, this is the same shit that got him in trouble in Iraq. <laughs> like, he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. And yeah. I love that. And I love that you were doing it not because you wanted to be alpha. It was so consistent with your story that you wanted to do it to protect somebody else. The fact that your thing that's stronger than your fear is your kids, uh, the camaraderie that you had over in Iraq. I mean, it's just like one story after another after another, and service is the word that just came to mind every time. And, and do you think of yourself like that, as living a life of service? Well, I come from a family full of military and teachers. I think that it, it falls naturally into wanting to take care of others. I, I just think that's the way life should be. We should all be taking care of each other in one way or another. And that motivates me. When I was doing my book, I hired a girl that I'd known for several years, Rebecca, to help me write it. And she pointed that out to me. She said, I don't think you've noticed, but that's what drives you. Mm. She pointed out to me that when I started getting into fitness, then I quit, then I started, then I quit. It was a cousin of mine. That's right, Corey. Yep, Corey, who was you know struggling with obesity. And then suddenly I was like, well, let's talk fitness. Then I was like, well, let's go to the gym. You know, and that's what got me going, mm. is knowing I was doing it for someone else. And that, yeah, I mean, that drives me. I think that having my kids, you know, being my motivation, I take pride in the fact that even with 
the success I've had, I still turn things down because my kids are a priority. I give speeches on leadership and I say, you know, I've been in front of CEOs and presidents of companies and I'm like, do not forget why you're successful or why you wanted to be successful was to take care of your family. So, I mean, think of your, every decision I make, I think what lessons is this going to teach my kids and how is this going to affect them? And I will turn things down. Before Dance with the Stars, Survivor called me mm. and I wanted to do it, but we had one phone call. X amount of weeks, no contact back home. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. Three kids here in Alabama, more important. Another show called, turned them down. Dance with the Stars called, said they put me in a house in L.A. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. Three kids here in Alabama, I can't do it. And right. Dina Katz, executive producer, said, not a problem. You, your dancer will come to Birmingham. You'll rehearse there and fly back and forth every wow. week. And all I could say was, crap, <laughs> I guess I'm doing it. <laughs> guess I have to learn how to dance. Yep. That's incredible, man. So now let's go somewhere even more interesting than that. Right. So here we have a man um, who clearly is motivated by service. Tell me about your reaction to Osama bin Laden being killed. This oh. really surprised me. Yeah, so right before, about a week or two before that, we had several tornadoes rip through the state of Alabama. It became a state of emergency. A lot of people lost their lives. And I again, I was injured. I went out and was doing, you know, disaster relief work. I was on tarping roofs. I mean, it was just out there working. And it felt, that was the first thing I'd done since my injury that I felt like I was accomplishing something. So it felt good to be out there. Mm. And I would go from sun up to sundown. And when I got home one night, now because of social media, like I was just about to go to bed, I was tired and I opened up. Facebook, and there was all these people saying, Osama bin Laden's been killed, bin Laden's been killed. I'm like, what is this? And then one of them said, the president's about to speak. And I turned the TV on. And because of social media, I mean, you're sitting there waiting for him to walk out. And he comes out, he says it. I remember, I remember being in Iraq when uh, Saddam Hussein was killed. And I remember when we were told, we were like, well, we're still fighting. It doesn't matter right. to us. So when that happened, it was like, okay, I didn't know if it affected me yet until my phone went off. A good friend of mine, Mandy, texted me and said, I want to thank you for your service and sacrifice. And even now, it's like just her saying that and acknowledging the fact that my entire life was changed. I lost two of my limbs because of what he caused. And oh, it broke me down. Like it was that one text from her, I mean, I got others, but it's like when I got that one, I sat on the couch and I cried because what that man did, I lost friends. I mean, everything changed. And I didn't realize how much anger and sadness there was just sitting inside. And I needed that cry. I needed that, that whole moment to happen. Mm. And it was, it was good. What really brought that home for me and, and made it clearly something that was like a part of who you are. So thinking of you as, as a man of service, and you said, I felt I needed to protect America from her enemies. I thought, enemies, that's actually a really interesting idea. And I wrote down a note and I said to ask you, like, do you still use this notion of enemies? And then when I heard how profoundly um, Osama bin Laden being killed affected you, and I thought, whoa, because there's like, literally the enemy that, that sort of kicked all this off. And to me, having an enemy is actually really powerful. Now that you're not in a military context, is that something that you still find like beating an obstacle course and the obstacle course is the enemy and do you think like that? I don't think so. Uh, my mindset is different. I, I, I tell people all the time, like I, I've never once, you know, would be the guy that's like, oh, is this amazing soldier? I, I was fun to be around, I was physically fit, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, you know, I, I got along with my leadership. Um, but I also had this mindset that every time I deployed, I was okay with death. Yeah, tell me about that. Like, that's... That sounds, I mean, I, I don't want to, I feel like it sounds like something out of a movie, but it is. You have, I think you're a better soldier if you're okay with dying. You know, your will is done, everything is taken care of, you're not coming back. Right. And that was the mindset I had. I'm either going to deploy over and over and over again and retire an old man, or I will die in combat. I was not prepared for the in-between, mm. so that threw me off. But I was okay with death. Now I'm 35, I'm not in the military anymore, I'm very close to my kids. Oh no, if I'm on a plane and we have some turbulence, I'm like, no, <laughs> not now. You know, it's, my mindset's different, I'm not right. the same. 
Uh, I'm glad I thought that way then, but I don't now. Um, to me, when it comes to the enemy, I think sometimes it's good to have something that, I mean, I'm a pretty positive guy, but I like to have something that drives me to want to outdo. You know, and I've seen, I've had organizations that I felt like weren't right with veterans. So that drove me to do certain things or to fight for things when it comes to veterans or not just for veterans issues, but for veterans to change the way they are. Uh, and I feel like me and there's a lot of other veterans that are in the, the spotlight that it's up to us. If we're going to make a change, we have to start doing that. And I take pride in the fact that I'm one of those people that veterans reach out to and have pride that I'm out there and showing that we're not crazy. You know, we're successful, we can go on and do other things. I think that, yeah, there's always these initiatives to hire veterans, but there's also this, there's this, these groups that are like, well, I don't know though. You always, the mindset is that these veterans are messed up, but we're not. We just have to get over what we've gone through and then move on. To be able to be a successful soldier takes a lot of skill. And that these men and women that go over there and deploy over and over again can be very successful in these other jobs. And we have to get their mind right and these companies need to see that. And I feel like the more people, more veterans that are out there publicly saying, yes, I'm a veteran and now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that, I think that's gonna improve things. All right, let's talk about mental health then. It, it, it features pretty prominently in, in your book mm -hmm. and certainly in what you've had to go through. And by the way, your honesty and vulnerability in the book are amazing, and I think that they- It was hard. I can only hard. imagine, and for anybody that hasn't read the book, they really don't understand what we're talking about. Um, you were really honest. Like, you did not try to paint yourself as like, hey, I'm a stud, look at me. Like, it was such a warts and all biography. Absolutely loved that part of it. Amazing, and I'm, I've got to imagine people reach out to you routinely to say that thank you for that, and it's... Yeah, I didn't know how people were going to react to it. I mean, I had all these people that followed me from Dance with the Stars that loved me, mm. and when the book hit the shelves, I was terrified. I was like, all these people are going to see a side of me that they have not seen, and they're going to hate me. And it has been a positive response because I was very open and honest. That's incredible. So I can imagine the kind of audience that you would build off of Dancing with the Stars, um, sort of very much like sort of right down the middle. Um, and some of the like behaviors that you had when you were angry were like, it's sort of the aggressive dickhead. You know what I mean? So for you to like put it out there and be like, let me walk you through what I was thinking so that you understand, like, I'm not justifying this. I'm just telling you it's real. Yeah. And it was like, God, like it was so defenseless and, and which made me feel super connected to you and to walk through that. But then it got me thinking like, what is that rebuilding process? So you've helped us see your journey, but I, I was like, what would he say? Like if somebody came up to that was in this situation, what would he do? If it's a soldier, what would he do if somebody's depressed, but they're not a soldier? Like having gone through it and having been so real, open and honest about what that process looks like, how do we, and give it to me in two ways. How do we systematically address the problem? And we'll just say of veterans going through it. And then on sort of one-offs on a one-to-one, -one, what does that look like? Well, I think, what needs to happen, I think that we've come a long way with mental health, but we have a long way to go. And what needs to happen is- Where, where would you say, how far have we come? When you say we've come well, a long we, way- Well, we, we acknowledge it. Okay. We acknowledge and it. And we didn't used to, which I would agree no, with. No, I mean, because you I look at veterans in the past, it was, you know, I think in World War II, it was called shell shock. Mm. It was all these different things, but it was not acknowledged in the way that it is now, but I think it needs to be talked about more. Okay. I think the more things are talked about, the more comfortable we are, and the more we can understand them. Uh, when I woke up one morning and saw that in a tweet that Prince Harry came out talking about his depression, it made me really happy. Oh. Because I've been places and someone has said, well, you lost an arm and a leg, so you had a right to be depressed, and I stopped him. I was like, depression is real. You don't, you don't even have to go through something traumatic. Some are caused by you know something traumatic. Some can be a, a chemical imbalance in the brain. And I feel like, if you had heart problems and saw a cardiologist, well, everyone would be concerned about you. Would know you're doing better, and it would be open and honest with the crew, anybody you no work stigma, with. Not yeah, weird. but the most complicated organ in your body. If you have a problem with it, suddenly there's a. We don't want to talk about that. No, and you can get over it, and that's what people need to realize. You can be cured. You can get past it. 
That's what we need to, need to realize. You know, the reason I did it is because when I was in my depression, I thought I was alone. I didn't open up to anybody. So I thought someone's going to read this and it's going to help them. So I just, as nervous as I was about the book, I kept thinking that one person is going to read it. Well, now it's open up this dialogue and I'll go and I'll speak and we'll do Q&A and people want to talk about it. I gave a speech in Florida and it was, it was an older crowd. It was just, like I was going to say, it was, they were old. And I... I speak what's on my heart, mm. and I gave my speech, and as I was closing, I kind of mentioned some depression, because I was, I was coming out of the winter months, and I, it hit me again this past winter, and I went and saw the doctor, and so it was on my mind, and it came up, and as I was saying, I thought, this generation of people probably aren't connecting to what I'm saying. When I walked off the stage, and they lined up, the amount of people that thanked me for talking about mental health. And here I was, I thought they didn't want to hear. I thought I was stepping out of line. No, it needs to be talked about because it's it's not just this generation. It's people are realizing more and more that it's an issue. Right. And the more we talk about it, the easier it is for people to be honest with themselves and get the help they need. Yeah, I really strongly agree with that. And as somebody who's struggled pretty profoundly with anxiety, it's that same thing of like, man, like if, if you have other people that are going through it, if you're able to talk about it, if you're even able to explain, like you said, you learn when you teach, right? So just even telling other people like what I've done to try to combat it, it's like, oh yeah, that is what I was doing. And then yeah. you can sort of reinforce it and systematize it. Um, do you, like when you're dealing one-on-one, -on -one, do you think differently about somebody that's been through combat and has depression from that versus somebody that... No, I don't. Um, I think that, because I think that depression is real and can affect anybody and there are traumatic things that can happen in your life, whether it's combat or not, that people go through. But is the path out different? I don't. I think there's a lot of similarities. I think that here's an example I give. Um, combat never gave me issue. In fact, I was never the happiest than I was in combat. And and you were the happiest in combat. Yes, I loved it. I mean, you got this tribe mentality. You you're, it's exciting. You're you know it's. Life or death. It's what people go to the movies and fantasize about. I love you say that with a smile, by the way. <laughs> it's life or death. <laughs> but it is. It's exciting. Um, but I think a quote from your book was, I like adrenaline and excitement, and nothing is more exciting than when bullets are flying at you. Yes. I'm pretty sure that's yep. like a there is, verbatim quote. It's, it's hard to find that kind of excitement anywhere else. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Probably for the best. But when I get, when I end up in the military, like suddenly, after that first appointment, I was like, oh, this is it. This is home. And I put in a power zone to go to special forces. I was going to do all this stuff. In fact, my second appointment, they were going to take me out of combat to go to school, to go to special forces. I was like, well, I'm not leaving combat for a school. Like, <laughs> I loved combat. So I had this, this vision of the future. And then I wake up one day, and two of my limbs are gone. Mm. My career is gone. Yeah, there's battling with injuries, but if you have a vision of the future and it's taken away, you don't know where you're going. I mean, think about where you're heading right now. If you woke up tomorrow and suddenly you'd never speak again, you can't even do this show anymore. Trust me, I thought of that when I was reading yes. the book. Well, that messes people up and they get hung up on the past. Mm. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the book, but I'm real proud of this little thing I came up with. Um, I call the, the Bundy effect. <laughs> Al Bundy on Married with Children mm. scored four touchdowns in a single football game. And if you watch any of those, all those seasons, every episode, he's depressed, except when he talks about that. He lives in the past. He never moved past it. So when I talk to veterans or anyone else that has gone through something that their life has shifted, I say, look, be proud of what you've done and where you've come from, but that was only a chapter in your life. Now it's time to conquer something else. I'm several chapters past mine. That's how I got over my depression, mm -hmm. was to say, okay, what's next? When I got back into fitness, well then it was, that's all I did, I worked out, ran races. Mm -hmm. I was like I was I felt like fitness was the answer. I was this close to going door to door and asking people if they've accepted fitness in their life. <laughs> like that was my mindset. <laughs> but then I got after Dance with the Stars like my <laughs> I could just see that. It's good. And my speaking engagements picked up and then I had all these other things I was doing. Business got busier mm. and one day I got home was on the road all week, and I was like, I haven't worked out all week. Why is this not driving me crazy? And I sat down to my bed, and I thought about it. Well, just like fitness, you have a goal. 
You know, you plan it. If you do it right, you need to plan your workouts, uh, where you're going, what you want to achieve. Well, in business, you plan where you want to go, how you're going to make those steps and what your goal is while I was doing that same thing. So it wasn't just fitness. It was setting goals, you know, and, and achieving little goals at a time, building to get to your next one. And I had somebody the day ask me, where do I see myself in five years? And I told him, I was like, you know, I can't answer that. I may be, I'd love to be in the public eye even more. I may not be. What I have found is in life, you can plan things and things happen and change. And you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. And that's what I plan to do. The only thing I hope to be doing in five years is to still be uh, trying to be the best father I can be. And that is the one thing that I keep focused all the time is being the best father, being the best father. And if something happens, I'm not in the public eye, all this, my 15 minutes is over. Well then, hey, shift gears, do the next thing. Don't let it eat me up. Be proud that I had this time and do the next. Most people say things like that and I call total BS. I actually believe it with you, which brings me to what was harder for you, dealing with your injury or dealing with your first son's um, bowel problems when he was born. That seemed terrifying. Yes, when you know him being born and losing seventy five percent of his small intestines, spending three and a half months at Children's Hospital. I mean, even when we went home, all this equipment hooked up to him. That was that was terrifying because we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I didn't allow myself to break down like I did when I was injured. Mm. I mean, that's just being honest. I could, but I. I was married to his mother, and I felt like I had to be the one to say, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And years later, even after we were divorced, she said that that's what helped her through it. But then when I got injured, I, I was like, well, this is it. Right. And I broke down. And then it was interesting because my father has one arm. And That's so weird. When I, Reading that, I was like, what, what, what? what? Yeah. I was like, how's that possible? And... For to grow up with a father with one arm doing construction my entire life, I remember he didn't, ha he was, it was hard on him in the hospital to be there with me. And I asked him, I said, Did you ever think one of your kids would lose a limb? And he said, No, I always was afraid. He was afraid he would lose just another one of his limbs. You know, it never crossed his mind that could happen to one of his own children. So it was this interesting thing that happened. But then, to have, you know, to be injured and then have my son Colston that went through all that come to Walter Reed and me spend a couple of days with him mm. lifted my spirits because then it reminded me that, yeah, it's going to be tough, but I have something else to live for. Mm. And that became very emotional. The, the, I was in physical therapy and my sisters walked in with him and I vaguely remember, I remember, I didn't remember, my sisters reminded me that the room was crowded and I saw him and was crying, just ugly cry. <laughs> and everyone just piled out, mm. you know what I mean? Left me alone with him. And I, I mean, it was very emotional to see him. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine, especially if that's the thing that you're living for if that's the thing that's motivating you that second deployment you. was harder because of my first appointment I had a wife mm. no children in fact I didn't even when everyone took two weeks leave I turned it down I remember that story she still doesn't know that <laughs> <laughs> I told her that it didn't come up for me but I didn't want to leave the second deployment I carried a picture of Colson with me everywhere mm. I went and there were moments that I remember thinking I hope he never experiences this I hope that what that us doing this or whatever's happening that he never experiences this. Do you think having his picture and thinking about him and having him in your mind made you a better or worse soldier? That's a good question. Like, I don't know because, you know, I mentioned that death, accepting death could make you a better soldier. Right. I mean, that could be argued, you know, <laughs> I don't know. That's, I would, but, um, but then having a son, like you, you may hesitate um, and you don't want to have that hesitation. But then also I had this mindset that was like, I hope he never experiences this and I'm just do what I have to do. And I, hopefully he's proud of me one day. Mm. I've got to imagine. He's getting to the age now where he's he 12. gets yes. what you're about. He, the other, I've been out of town for a couple of days. I'll head back tomorrow. And about 
three days ago, I get a random text. He's 12 now, so he has, his, he has a phone. And he texted me and said, I just watched Pearl Harbor, and I just wanted to thank you for your service and sacrifice. Oh. I'm looking at the phone like, like thinking, you're my son. You're not even supposed to be thinking that way <laughs> about me. I mean, choked me up. Wow, yeah. And I was like, buddy, thank you so much. I mean, obviously, he's, he's wanting something. No, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was very sweet. He does. He is very appreciative of all the kids. You know, I have, I'm, I have three amazing kids. What do you hope your kids take away from you? Like, what are some just core To not lessons? let anything, start to just always achieve for the, I always tell them, you don't have to be the best, just always give me your best. You know, because I think I don't, I'm not that person that expects my kids to be, you know, whatever they do, they have to be the all star. Mm. But if they're giving me their best, then that's all I can ever ask of them. I would say you have a deep problem with authority. I don't know if you'd agree with that. You never <laughs> say it, but you dropped out of high school in ninth grade. Um, definitely, there were signs in the book that you didn't always agree with leadership. I think that's pretty clear. No. Um, but you're really bright. So dropping out of high school was not because you couldn't hack it. It was because something about the system bothered you. Yes. So A, I guess, do you agree with that assessment that you have a deep problem with authority? And then do, do any of your kids push back like that? Yes, I do. I, I work on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes. Do you think you need to work on it, actually? Well, <laughs> because I think it's, I do as well, and the woman who was in charge of taming me as a child is sitting here, and I actually consider it one of my most effective qualities. Yeah, you know, I think I said that just to try to sound respectable. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to say you're not honest. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, you know, every time I've, Buck the system, it wasn't out of just because someone told me to do something. I don't mind hearing someone say, do this, I'm fine with it. Okay, if it needs to be done. But if I have a problem with why it's happening, right. I speak up. That's interesting. And I take pride in that. You know, and now I have I have people that work for me. And because of that, I make sure and take care of them and hear them. And I tell them all the time. You're here because you do what I can't do. I don't need another Noah. Right. I need you to do what you do because you're amazing at it. And, and, I will, and I feel like I have seen failed leadership do things that I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it differently. And I have seen, I've had success from that with people I work with. You know what I mean? I will defend them. I will do whatever it takes to take care of them because if they take care of me, I'm going to take care of them. And that has worked to my advantage. And I think that when I've bucked the system is because I didn't like the way the system worked. Now, I have an older sister that <clears throat> has her PhD in childhood education. You know, is everywhere she's ever taught, she has to change the way it works. And someone said, why do you always change it? Because it's not right. Now, Hers is a little more educated in the way she does it. Mine's a little more barbaric. <laughs> but we have that same mindset where it's like, you know what? No, if it's not right, we're going to make it right. I'm going to steal one of your stories for a second. This one is so good. And I don't know if I can get you there without just telling you the story, which proves your point here. So it was the time you guys were chasing uh, like a white truck. You spot the white truck. It takes off over a bridge. You go. The guy stops. Do you remember what you said? Yep, I do. So... Well, okay, so another guy was driving. Mm -hmm. and Which you already hate. Yep, I like to be in control. <laughs> uh, and this bridge, this is a shady looking little bridge. <laughs> and these Humvees, 9,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. You got a group of guys in it. So, I mean, he didn't, looking back, yeah, okay, he thought, okay, we probably shouldn't go across this bridge. Right. That little truck zoomed across it. But I was mad. Like, I don't know exactly, but I was, and then I told the platoon leader, Lieutenant Edson later, I said, I need to be driving because I don't care if we're driving next to a cliff. If you say turn right, I'm turning right. <laughs> you know, that needs to happen. There should be no hesitation. I went back and reread the sentence because I was like, wait, did I is that, catch, what I, is, is that, that is what exactly I what you said. You said, if we're, driving on a, if we're driving on a road and there's a cliff to our right and you tell me to turn right, I will turn right. Yeah. And I was like, wow. This man is not here to play around. I really, but you have, you, it is so dangerous to take your personality any one piece, but when you take it as a gestalt and you realize, okay, this is a man of service 
who pushes against the system when he thinks it's broken because he's not serving the other people. He's not a selfish guy. He's way more interested in protecting other people than he is in protecting himself. So when you say to somebody who clearly you had a history with, you trusted this guy, believed in his leadership, and was that the guy that you had made the promise? Like, no matter what happens, I will protect, will protect you. you. Yes. So that you're making like that, oh God, I have the chills again. Like it was just one of those things where I was like, you have a code that you live by and it is very clear in your every action. One, I appreciate you saying that. This is who I am, this is what I stand for and I take pride in that. Mm. I don't know where I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna stick to who I am and see where that takes me. I think that's a very smart strategy and as somebody who really believes in that, that we're living through a time now, unlike anything else in human history, where the thing you will be rewarded for or punished for the most is who you really are. And I think people, and now because of the way we're connected, yeah, I can, you can open up, so you can open up social media right now and if you stalk someone well enough on their Facebook or Instagram, you can see their personality. For sure. A good reputation will follow you, a bad reputation will beat you there. Nice, there you go. All right, I wanna go back to something that you said earlier about the disaster recovery relief um, work that you did when the tornado hit. Tell us about the hammer. And oh. why, why did you work that hard? So, what had happened was, it was late in the day, it's about to start storming, you know, it's gonna rain, and a guy rushes in, and he's like, I need tarps, I need tarps now. And we're like- House has been destroyed by- Yeah, tornado. we're like, well, we're going with you. So we rush out there, half of his house is gone. I mean, the whole wall is gone, laid out, just brick, mortar, everything. Roof is gone, he's just trying to tarp up to save what's left in the house before the rain comes. We're up there, we're hammering, and I'm on the edge, and then this hammer goes flying into the rubble. I'm like, well, there goes a the hammer. And I said, okay, I, I need another hammer. And the guy just looks down there and he's like, that was my dad's hammer. And I just saw, oh, I mean, it hit me, the look on his face. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we'll find it, we'll find it. And then he was like, no, 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 let's, you know, and then we finished the tarp and then we're down back in the yard and he's just looking out there. I'm like, we'll find it. We'll find it. Then it's like he saw that I was concerned. He's like, no, it's a hammer. Right. Don't worry about it. It's just a hammer. And he was like, you know, it was my dad's and you know, he passed away and this and that. And I was like, oh, I gotta find this hammer. <laughs> so then I am walk, dry, and, and they didn't want me out there. Cause I mean, you got, I, you know, all this rubble and I'm trying to get through and I'm out there and it's starting to rain. And I'm like, I'm just so mad at myself for losing that hammer. Mm. And it's like I've looked for as long as I looked and I turn and there's a bush sitting there and the hammer is hanging in the bush. And I take that hammer and I give it to the guy and he was so happy. I mean, for him to be like, don't worry about it. Mm. No, he was worried about it. So I was worried about it. And I am so glad I found that hammer. It's interesting. It's one of those stories that like, it hits me so hard. And I'm like, I'm not even sure like what thing to hold on to of why it hits me so hard, but I just thought, one, you're telling the story in the book, so I'm like, of all the things in your universe that you could talk about, you, that becomes the most poignant moment of the, you're out there like rebuilding houses for just to help humanity, and the story becomes about making sure that you find this guy's hammer again. And man, I really wanna tell you that I have like a wrap up to that story, but that's like one of those things, it's, it's gonna stick with me for a long time. It's really, really interesting. Is that a story you would tell your kids? And if so, what would you tell them is like the, the moral of that story? Yeah, I think, I think the, I mean, I hadn't thought about it that much. I mean, it was a powerful part of my life just to experience, but I guess when it comes to a moral to that is something as insignificant as a hammer to me is so much more to someone else. That's an amazing moral to that story. Um, what do you think the, the next chapter is gonna be? And I don't necessarily mean career, but you've done such a great job of having these major movements in your life of you know, being the warrior and recognizing that so few people could do that to then going through the hard time, but coming out of it realizing that in service to others and a willingness to be vulnerable, you're able to bring something. Um, what, What's the next chapter hold, do you think? Uh, you know, I think that, I take pride in the fact that, yeah, I'm an, 
I'm, I have a disability. I'm an injured veteran. And, you know, there's been other things I've, I've done. And I will always be seen as that. I'm fine with that. But I also want to show people there's so much more than that. And I want to continue that road of, of doing things that will show a side that, you know, is beyond what's so visible. Um, but I also... What's a side of you you think that people don't yet see? I, I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty open and honest about things. So I don't think there's anything I really hide that people wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, even something as simple as I mean, people that follow me on social media know I love the Golden Girls. Really? I mean, yeah, I'm a huge Golden Girls fan. That's amazing. Yeah, I have a shirt. What is it about the Golden Girls that you like? It's an amazing television show. <laughs> 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 but like, you know, I remember when I was talking about that one day on social media and my followers were like, I love that you're just like this guy that's like, oh yeah, I love the Golden Girls. Right. You know what I mean? Or the notebook. I talk about that yeah. in the book. You know, yes, hey, you I have a sensitive side and I'm, I'm wearing a pink <laughs> shirt. All right, I'm okay with it. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty open about things. So I don't think there's anything that people don't know. No, I, a, a chapter I see happening in, my, in the future, not now, I will be in politics. Really? I think so. That's interesting. Anytime okay. I've gone to DC, I've worked with, you know, I've worked with a, a lot of people in Congress. I've been to State of the Union. I've met with the president. I've done all these different things. And every time I'm there, I'd kind of get this bug. Mm. And I feel like I could make an impact. Uh, I feel like too many politicians don't know how to explain things to people. That I think that if you explain the policies in a way that's like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? And not try to hide so much, so much just put it out there and say, look, this is why we're doing this. Yeah, it may cause this, but we're gonna to try to counteract it with this and try to actually try to improve our country. I love my country. I feel like we are still improving. I've never thought that we've ever set back. We, we make mistakes. We're still a young country, but we still wanna keep going forward. And I feel like we can do that at an even more accelerated rate if we are working together. And I think there needs to be more of that. And I would love to be one of those people that is up on the hill that is trying to fight to make that happen. That's incredible. If I can start voting for you now, just let me know. All right. That would be amazing. All right, before I ask my last question, um, where can these guys find you online? NoahGalloway.com is my website. And from there, you can also connect to my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All right. My last question, what is the impact that you want to have on the world? I put my children first. Everything I do, I think of my children first. And then you expand that. Well, what are we teaching the next generation? What are, we, what are we doing for the next generation? What are we doing to prepare the next generation? I think that's what we have to be thinking about all the time. I think not enough people think about those following our footsteps. So just like I do at the house, I do with my children, then you widen that. Well, then it's something, as a veteran, when it, I tell people when it comes to the VA, I'm like, we can argue the VA back and forth, but you know what? Vietnam veterans fought hard to get it where it is today, and it would be a disservice to them if my generation lets it go to waste, and it would be selfish of us not to think about the generations after us. So we have to be enrolled and involved to make it better. So that's thinking of those after us. So I think that an impact I would like to make on the world is to not always think about yourself, but think about how we're affecting those that are following us. That is so Noah Galloway of you. That is amazing. <laughs> so Noah Galloway of you. Noah, I thank like you that. so much for coming on the thank show, you. man. Absolutely incredible. And by the way, in all seriousness, thank you for your service and your thank sacrifice. You. I'm absolutely amazing. Guys, first of all, read his book. It is absolutely unbelievable. I have seen, as you well know, every interview this guy's done, and I'm telling you, nothing does it the service of reading it firsthand. You've got to go in, just hear it. You're inside of his head. And while I've never heard him talk about politics before, I am deadly serious. If I could start voting for him now, I would. And let me tell you why. When you take his personality in totality and you realize that you have somebody that's not afraid to mix it up and whoop a little ass, which I'm a huge fan of, but does it in service of other people, I want the guy that stands up when the guy that can't stick up for himself when a big guy's eating his cookies, I want the guy that stands up for that guy to be the guy I give my Kool-Aid to, quite frankly. So looking at the way that he is, he lives by a code. There are things that he believes about taking care, not only of yourself, but more importantly, taking care of those around you, taking care of the people that you love, that love you, creating a community and really being of service to that community, no matter how far you stretch that community out. 
And that to me is one of the most beautiful ways to live a human life that there is. And the most incredible part is not when somebody lives a life that seems too good to be true. It's when they live a life that you say, thank God that's not me. And you look at where they are today and you envy them and you think, they're incredible and what they've done to their mind is absolutely extraordinary. And when I look at him, I see that. I see somebody to look up to. I see somebody that has done to his mind something that is far more astonishing than what he's done to his body. And the fact that he's willing to talk about that even now he struggles with depression but knows how to deal with it and actually takes steps to do so, uh, to me is incredible and is really the warrior's mindset. So uh, this is somebody that I cannot encourage you enough to dive into the world to watch, to learn from them, to read, and to support the things that they do in the future. So Noah, thank you so much again for joining us. My friends, until next time, be legendary. Take care. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Impact Theory. If this content is adding value to your life, our one ask is that you go to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Not only does that help us build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about, but it also helps us get even more amazing guests on here to share their knowledge with all of us. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this community. And until next time, be legendary, my friends.